Hello and welcome once again to the dangerous and exciting adventure world of simple groundwork and diorama techniques. I am your host Bill Grigg, I am your instructor. And as usual with all the fanfare and confetti flying and planes flying over and bombs dropping and uh, 105 millimeter cannons going off to da 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 We have the infamous, yeah! the seldom duplicated, but never equaled, Clam Bake Dave. Yeah, <laughs> you, think I'm, you think I'm pushing the limits there, Dave, on that one? That's all right. That's all right. So we are into now episode number 22, 22. And we are going to continue along with our... AC-47 gunship. Now, hopefully, hopefully, folks, I'm going to get in and actually start to glue some pieces together here. I'm not going to promise anything to you, <laughs> but we'll give it a shot. Keep your fingers crossed. But there is still a lot of preliminary painting to do. Now, what I have done is I have gone in and I have taken a simple little board Simple little scrap piece of pla uh, scrap piece of wood. I took two pieces of other wood, put it underneath. Now the reason I did this is sometimes pieces have a tendency to hang over the edge. That's why I raised them up and don't just do it on a flat board. You can see I've got my two seats on here, and I am going to continue painting. Now I'm going to go over my old palette, open up my thinner, go over to my old palette. Regenerate some paint off the old palette and go in and paint this seat. There we go. Now, whoop, eject, eject, eject. Here's a good teaching thing. You drop a piece, you don't want to get all crudded up. Grab it with a pair of tweezers. What happens sometimes is the tape gets wet. Now, huh, it does say paint the back of the seat green, so I shall. All that seems to be the other thing on this is the pad. That's not working. That is not working. Let's turn that up right there. Yes, I did that. And now, we're just going to take a little brown. I think I will use this right here, a little brown, stir our paint, but again, I've been building a lot lately, so I don't really need to give it a stir, 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 because it is pretty well stirred up. Put it on my palette, put my piece over, obviously folks, I'm, I'm always taking my stirrers and I'm putting them on to my where where the paint drips off so you don't really care the butter top or whatever it was margarine top or I don't know what it was I don't know a little PBM before we put the paint bottle away I'm getting uh, fantastic comments from my uh, students telling me how much better they like this and how be they become religious PBM people and they're not losing paint they're not, no longer losing any paint paint is staying good for them for a long time we go up here, go into our seat cushion. This is not the best brush in the world. I am not going to use this brush. And I'll show you exactly why I'm not going to use this brush. Bring this brush head over here, put it up against my shirt, get my little pointy. See, it's all exploded. See that brush head, it's all exploded. That is not good for detail painting. Don't use this. This is a great brush for washing, great brush for dry brushing, but literally, no, no, no. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in with the brush beside it, that very pointed brush, and I will do the seats with that. Folks, again here, do as I say, do as I say, not as I do, because honest to God, I'd go in with that ratty brush and paint, but I want to teach you the right way. So I go in, and again, just like I did the equipment in episode 21, I pull right along that edge. It's best if the piece does not move for you. 
and come out onto this outer edge of the seat cushion. And again, like I said, gang, once this uh, once this fuselage is together, you're really not going to see a lot of that. I contaminated that tape, so what I'm going to do now is just put down a fresh piece of tape. I'm just using regular old masking tape. Folding it over. Put it down here. And take my seat. And stick it to it. Very easy. If you have double stick tape, it works pretty well. Again, go in. I think I'll grab just a tiny bit of thinner on the tip of the brush. Go to the corner of my palette. Yeah, that's better. It's a little thinner. And go into my seat again. Right along this edge. Now, on a, on a piece like this, I've built this plane many times. I've built this plane twice before. So I know what I'm going to see and I know what I'm going to do. But when you have these type of applications and builds like this where it's not a critical interior piece, it's not, uh, how, um, how do I say this? It's, it's, it's not a critical piece because it's not going to show. So therefore, you can take and try techniques on this that you might not necessarily do in, let's say, like a, um, an open cockpitted plane like a P-47 or a P-51 or a Corsair or a Hellcat, any single-engine fighter that you can take, slide that canopy back and look down into the interior and see all this marvelous detail. This is not. This is an enclosed cockpit aircraft. You can see it. It's an enclosed cockpit aircraft. When all this stuff is put together, it's going to go away. As a matter of fact, the radio compartment is right in this area right here. Well, if you can see it when I turn the plane around, this is where my radio compartment is. There's not even a view window. There's nothing in there. So all this detail is, is adios, you know. But... You do it anyhow because this is a great place to practice on your pieces that if you do make mistakes and stuff, it doesn't make any difference if you make any mistakes in this stuff. It doesn't make any difference if you're a little sloppy. This is where you learn and refine your techniques so you're no longer sloppy, so you're no longer making a mess. And it's a good place to practice this stuff. So again, let's clean the brush. My other pieces that I have washed are dry now. So let me show you these two things. And I'm sorry I'm being so all over the place random, but that's how that's truly how, how you build this stuff. You, you jump all over the place. But now let me show you these two things right here. These two pieces of equipment. Now you remember when we painted these? Did I paint these in 20? Yeah, I painted these in 21, didn't I, Dave? Um, you can see how the wash has really accented and highlighted everything that's around it. So again, what we would do with these is, we would go in and we'd just give it a little enhancement, not much. Take our zinc, grab our stirrer. Don't even have to do hardly much of this because I've already done it so many times. Out onto the pallet. And again, what are we doing, folks? PBM. Insert your answer here. And what is it, Dave? Good and loud. PBM. PBM. Yes, sir. PBM. Keep this PBM going all the time, all the time. Close up your paint so it doesn't go all over the place in case we have a little accident. And unlike Bob Ross, <laughs> folks, unlike Bob Ross, we don't have happy little accidents in scale modeling. In the joy of painting, we have happy little accidents, but we're here we have friggin' disasters. So, <laughs> so uh, keep that in mind. Let's do a little, little bit of highlighting here. And what I'm going to do now, just like I was answering that, that gentleman's question in episode 21, I'm doing the same thing here. I'll pick up a little bit of that, that zinc, 
because that's my highlight color, yet my base is in interior green washed with a darker color called medium green. Okay, so I didn't do the mixture, I just put in a darker color for the wash, and now I'm going to highlight that by grabbing some interior green and some zinc. We'll come over to the dry brush palette, see about where we are, that's pretty good, I want a little bit greener. You notice I go right into the same spot, that way I know exactly where I am. I pull it out, dry brush it out, and I just go in, oh I've got a niche folks, sorry, i got a niche. Go out and let's just hit this just real quick, real easy. Again, it's a good spot to practice this stuff. Hit your ledges. And that's exactly what you're doing here. You're practicing this stuff. Because again, like I said, you're not going to see much of this when it's done. I bet, matter of fact, I, I'm almost positive we're not going to see any of this when we're done. Okay, let's go and enhance. Let's go in and enhance the instrument faces. I'll clean my brush. I'm going to get out some different paint. And we'll be back in like a half a second. <laughs> and we'll do, the, uh, we'll do the instrument faces. So we'll be right back. All right, now that we've done our little, little bit of highlighting, we want to take the instrument faces, and we want to take those instrument faces and get those instruments so they pop out. And again, because it's an interior piece and not going to be seen, this is a good place to practice your dry brushing on your instrument faces. So what I have done is I have taken a little bit of white. I'm going to get out a black piece of paper this time. I've taken a little bit of white put it out in my palette and I will dry brush this out over here. You might as well come right over to the come over to the black, Dave, and watch this done. And see that right there? That's about where I want to be. Right about there. We come over to our instruments and very lightly we just start to pull across. and that actually needs to be backed up so it doesn't move. Make sure your pieces don't move when you do this. And again you can start to see these faces grow. You want to make sure that you have no clumping on your brush If it does clump, I'll show you a trick, because that clumped a little bit right there on me. But there's your instruments coming right up, all your radios. Oh, well, there must be, no, the radio guy would have nothing to do with the mini guns. He'd have nothing to do with those. So this is probably nav equipment, radio, you know, radio equipment. It would be a nav station. That's pretty good. Go on to the next piece. You can see I'm doing this with a fairly dry brush, but I do need to keep picking up. And come back over. When I go off screen, folks, with a brush, I'm just strictly dry brushing the brush out and the piece of paper. And I'm not using the best brush in the world, so... But there are, there are our instruments, a little highlight and a little dry brush. It is a little messy. So what we're going to do is, I'll fix these. I'm going to fix this right now and if it goes, if it gets a little mushy that's okay. Because like I say it's an interior piece. Uh, to, to harden this back up a little bit, what we would do is exactly this. 
And this is where the dropping of the brush becomes very important. I got the white out. One of the few times I actually clean my brush. I'm going back into my black, that old pool of black, regenerating a little bit. I need to know exactly where I am now though. This is critical. And I'm just going to go on top of this. And I've got to do it, you know what, you know what I'm going to do folks, you know what I'm going to do. See how much better that instantly is? It killed all that, that streaking from that clumping. But this is where you practice this stuff. You don't go out and practice this on these interiors of, of, of pieces that you can see. Because if that regenerated that, that would probably would have turned to light gray. It would have turned to mud on me, you know. And I think I will do the same thing with this instrument here. But again, like I say, I'm just, I'm, oh, that's, that's a million times better. <laughs> you can see that. See how much better that is? That's got to lay flat though for the full effect. Well that's very very nice. I see a little box there that I want to enhance. It's dark green so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into my dark green. Let me dry this brush. Uh, when you clean the brush, when you after you clean the brush, when you're doing what I'm going to do, notice what I do. I don't take the brush and do this with it. Watch what I do. I just take my brush and I just touch it. Because I'm looking for a dry brush color, a highlight color. Uh, let me see that box is, what I do with the box? That box is right there. I want to just get this, we might as well show them before and after Dave. Get that X right there in that box and I want to enhance that X in that box. So that's what I'm going to do. I'll take a little of my interior green, a little of my zinc, come over to my dry brush palette. Oh, that's way too light. Let's grab some of that medium green. Put that in that. That's pretty, oh, that's actually too dark. Now I had a little zinc. Oh, this is getting to be a good color. There's a good color I'm looking for. Dry brush it out. Again, we see the X. I'm going to go down, set it down flat, and just pull across that X. And a little more zinc for the X itself. And just gentle touch, just gentle, gentle, gentle. Now that kind of messed that up. So that's what we're going to do. We'll take care of that with a little thinner right around the edges. And just work that out. But like I say, again, it's an interior piece. And there you can see how the X came right up for us. Done the same thing over here on this piece here. Now that I got that zinc in there, I might as well might as well continue right here. See, this is not good. This is not good. I have way too much thinner on this brush. Pull that thinner out, go back into that zinc. Dry brush that zinc out. And I will hit these nice and lightly. Let's see if I can do this on camera for you. Nice, nice, nice. Not bad at all. Pull that up. Let's grab a little of the white. Because I see I've got... Whoa! This is not working. Not working, not working, not working. Tell you what. Forget that. I know I've got a little silver out here. And I just want to go in and hit these faces in here. And again, if I can do this like this. Oh, 
This is just being kind of lazy here to get these faces up. Definitely need some more solar. Actually, what I should really do, folks, is I should stop being so lazy and actually get some paint. But I only have this little small application to do. Beautiful, 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 beautiful. And that is it. Oh, there's one more radio piece here. I gotta get out some more paint. This is just craziness. Stop being the lazy painter, Bill. Start teaching these people correctly. And a little bit of white out. No PBM required there because I didn't make a mess. Pick this up, go onto my black. Oh, that's working real nice now. Go into this. I've got a little radio face right there. Oh, this one came out real good. Go the opposite direction. Oh, that came out very nice. That came out very nice. Let me move this piece so you can see it. It is a really nice fit instrument face. It came out really, really well. Very happy with that. Okay. Now, what else have we got here? Are our seats dry? Yes, our seats are dry. So now we can do the exact same thing. We keep just keep doing the exact same thing. I'm going to go into that old field drab, that brown that I was using for my seats. Grab a little of that. Grab a little zinc. Come over to my palette. Pull that out. And just go into these seats and just hit the tops of these seats. Boy, is that nice. Jeez, did that come up nice. Clean the brush and I'll show you the seats. And you can see the whole process of exactly what I'm doing. This is exactly how you go about doing this. And there's the tops of the two seats. We should also go in with a little bit more of the zinc. I'm just running out of paint, folks. So I'm going to reload these things a little bit. Reload everywhere a little bit. Made a mess. Make a mess, clean it up. Grab that brush. Seems like my green is still pretty good. Yep, it's going good. You can tell by the dry brush. And again, I'll just go in and hit these seats. Just easy, easy, easy. Uh, as a matter of fact, I don't want them to move, so I'm going to hold them in place. And just hit these just easy, easy, easy. Nice. Very nice. Just enough. Now, here's what I wanted to show you because we do everything on the cheapy cheap here. Well, not the cheapy cheap, but very inexpensive. We try to keep our expenses down. And because these seats are not going to really be seen, this is what we're going to do. I have a clear piece of uh, plexiglass here. Um, I use it for a, cutting, for a cutting board. Now, this is all I'm going to do. I'm going to take this, go down. I've got to get a straight edge. When you know it, where's my little straight edge? That's all right, we'll use this. Oh, it's right in front of my face. 
Okay, just a little steel rule. Take this, come down onto this piece, get it about so wide, and cut a strip. Pick it up with your knife tip. Good. Stick it down again. Give yourself a square end. Take it over the seat. I might have to do this at a weird angle. Ew. Okay, there we go. Put it down. Take my cutters. Get it off. Stick it back. Do the exact same thing. Give myself a square end. These are seat belts you too can make at home. And again, stick that down. Whoa. Bring it up over the back of the seat. Cut it off. Stick it in place. And voila, folks. We have seat belts on the seat. Now, to make these even a little bit better, what we're going to do is we'll take a little silver or a little aluminum paint. Find my... Ooh, boy, that clumped up quick. And we go put a little bit out. And now, with a very fine point brush, oh, and a little what, what, folks, what are we doing, what are we doing, folks? PBM, PBM. PBM. Take my pointed brush, grab a little of that, and go on to the belt. There's my Oh boy, that can't move. It can't move, gang. It cannot move on you. If it's moving, you have bad. And just put a little dabble do you on the end of that. A little dabble do you right there. And right in the middle. And right in the middle. Now, when those dry, <laughs> you can take a pencil eject. You can take a pencil and just draw a couple lines in there. I'm rushing things. This should be dry, but uh, I can't see why this won't work. As long as it doesn't move. And I, I'm, I'm, I, you're not going to be able to see this, but you know what I'm going to do. I'd be better off with a flare. And I've got a little I've got a little mess here that went onto my seat. So I'll just take a little thinner and pull that away. And there we have some seat belts. So this you too can do at home. It's a very inexpensive, very easy way to do a seat belt without going into all that high-tech and very expensive photo etch brass. The one thing you may want to do is push your tape in, well not may want to do, the one thing you do want to do is push your tape in good and hard so it's good and sticky. Then when you put your flat coat on top of this, it will seal everything in and it will hold everything in place. So there's a good, good, quick way, inexpensive way to make a seat belt. What else are we going to do now? Now we are going to go, well first we're going to clean our brushes. And what are we going to do? I think folks, how am I doing time wise Dave? About 20 minutes. About 20 minutes, okay. Now I wish we had the theme to 2001, 2001 to play. 
Lord and behold, oh my goodness, call the governor and raise a flag. We are actually going to glue some pieces in place. What shall we start out with? We shall start out with number 47, the cockpit bulkhead. Okay. I do believe... Now, we have in our floor, we have a small hole, large hole. On our piece, we have small tab, large tab. So how is this going to fit? Mystery, mystery. Oh, gee, I wonder how this is going to fit. Maybe it might fit likey so. Yes, yes. Yes, it does. Now, here's another trick. Instead of making a mess on your interior pot with all this glue, because we can go to the bottom, we can actually take some liquid glue with a little brush applicator, flip this over, and apply our glue from the bottom. Who cares it's the bottom if you make a mess? Doesn't make any difference. And that is more than enough glue to hold that piece in place. Absolutely more than enough glue to hold that piece in place. Okay. We continue looking at our instructions. And we see that, I think this is the back piece, 75. Yes, it is. It's the rear piece. Number 75 goes right back here. And as you remember, folks, I put, is that glaring, Dave? Nope. I put the 75 in the back of the piece, so I'm absolutely positive this is the piece that goes there. And again, oh, here's, here's another trick. Here's another trick. Let's say that when you painted this piece, every, uh, one, one thing that, that you should know, uh, students here, is glue does not attach well to a painted piece. It does. It does work, but... It, it's not as, as good as if you were to do this correctly. Now, me, myself, personally, I wouldn't do this, but don't build the way I do. Build correctly. Here's a good trick. This tab, obviously, is going into that receiving pot right there. But because there is paint there and paint on my tab, I may not get a good adhesion with my glue. So what I'm going to do is, this is a good trick, this is a good trick. You take your liquid glue, this is a good trick. <laughs> I take my tab, I put it on my tab. Got that, Dave? Am I moving too fast? No, you're doing fine. Okay. Put it on the tab and just let it sit there for a second or so. Let's, I'll put this down so I can close this glue up. Actually, I'm going to be using the glue in two seconds, but I just want you to see this. Glue sat in that tab for about what now? 20 seconds? 10 seconds? Here's what we're going to do. We take our knife tip. <laughs> and lo and behold, look at the bottom of that tab. No paint in that tab no more. See why it's good to have plastic joining with plastic instead of painted plastic joining with painted plastic because it's going to come off and you could lose your adhesion joint there. So again, we take this, I see there's a seam along the bottom, so I'm going to do this totally different. Let me show you the seam that I'm talking about. There is my receiver hole and you can see the channel right in there. That's the channel in there. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my liquid glue, which I am really running low on. I'm going to take it and I'm going to run it very carefully right through that channel. I'm going to put a little bit on the tab on either side and I will run a bead along the bottom and into, and we install. And there it is. Now the one thing that we need to do on this is we need to make sure this bulkhead is, is, is sitting correctly. 
So what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to take this and run some glue right along that edge. So that's got something to stick to and then this is how you get your, your parts to align correctly. You know what's got to go into this fuselage. I don't think it makes any difference which side. I don't think so. We're going to take our fuselage, we're going to take our interior part, and we are going to install it. Oh, let's use the other side because here's why I'm going to use the other side, folks. We've got this. Okay, we've got this. We've got our locating pins here. You can see them. But on my corresponding piece, I have these little guides right here. Eject, eject. I have uh, these guide pins right here. So I need to go about this differently. And you can see, see, there's a good example, folks, of painted pieces really not sticking together. Which side is this? This side. This side. Okay. Now, I know that I can get an absolute dead nut on fit here because I've got my locating pins. And they fit right there. Oh, crap. Well... See, I, 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 this is tough for me to do on TV because I really need to set this down flat and do this. But you get the general idea of what I'm doing. I'm putting these locating pins in here and getting this tight so I know how everything fits. Kind of like that. But obviously, without me actually taking this plane... Here's, I'll show you, this is the exact, the exact way I'm going to, you're not going to be able to see me do it, but this is how you would actually do this. Turn this right around, lay it right flat down so I can actually see what I'm doing, and put this over my, my mounting pins. And that is like a million times better. And push this up straight. Here we go. That is how that fits. This is off. There's a little stop pin right there too that's stopping that forward bulkhead from moving. Oh, this is making me angry. I'm going to put some crazy glue in there in a second. Instant glue. But that's what I'm looking for. And this is how I would put my pieces in and let my interior bulkheads dry. So once that's dry, then I know I'm, I'm pretty good in the ballpark that everything, once I install it and all my glue is dry, it's going to drop right into that fuselage and I'm not going to have any problems fighting this thing because it, the glue dried in its proper alignment position. That's a good way to put that. Dried in its proper alignment position. Okay, so let's take that and just put this aside. And you can see I'm just laying that down flat. Might as well get a shot of that, Dave. Get this out of the way. See that? It's just sitting there. Let me see if I can turn this so they can see it a little bit better, Dave. Yep. That's much better. That much better? And that's how I'm going to let that sit and just dry. But again, I see there's another bulkhead that needs to go in there. And I really, really should put that in. But you know what? Let's let that sit and tack a little bit before I go and install the next bulkhead. Because obviously I'm in the correct position over there to get everything straight. So we just let that, let that sit and dry. Here's what I wanted to bring up to you. 
this particular kit. Um, they put this kit out in several versions. They put this out as a, um, it was a gunship. It was a straight out C-47, which a lot of the parachutists jumped out of during D-Day, the invasion of D-Day. They're usually the ones you see in the movies with the big white and black stripes on them and all the guys pouring out of them. Those are C-47s, exactly the same aircraft this is. And then they put this out as a civilian uh, airliner. We used a lot, we flew a lot of these. As a matter of fact, um, Dave Cape Air was flying C-47s for a long time back and forth to what? Nantucket, right? Mm -hmm. Cape Air flew to Nantucket. So here's the deal, gang. What they have given you is they have given you two sets of props. One you can see is a really pointed tip, and the other one is what they call a paddle blade propeller. So how do we know which ones are proper for this C-47 that we're building? And I will show you that next. And we're rolling, Dave? We're rolling. We're rolling, okay. Here's what I'm doing, folks. I'm taking a look at C-47s to determine where the, where the pointed props were used and where the paddle blade props were used. So now, let's take a look at this. And what I'm going to do is I'm just reading the caption that's below the picture. As the war intensified, land transportation became increasingly dangerous with a VC attempting to cut all major roads, blah, blah, blah. Vitally needed supplies were delivered by C-47s to ensure their receipt. Uh, these C-47s are being loaded with food and medical supplies for shipment to Da Nang following a severe tropical storm which left thousands of Vietnamese civilians homeless without food. So we know this is a military C-47, not one flown by... TWA or Northwest Airlines or things like that. This is where we find our reference. We're going to come up and Dave, you are going to get a picture of, <laughs> without it sticking to the tape, Dave, you are going to get a picture of this top aircraft right here. And tell me when there's no, no glare? No glare. Okay. Now, as you can plainly see, that is a military bird and it does have the paddle blade style of prop opposed to that very pointy tip of the prop. Now, another thing in this picture is, you notice, I gotta, I'm going to turn this book around so I can take a good look at it, folks. Because I don't want to lie to you. Yep, okay, let's go back and let's go right back to that picture, Dave. Now, you can see no glare, Dave? No glare. Okay. You can see that these blades are black. Those are very black blades. Tip it back. This way? Uh, no, back. This way? No, forward. Forward. Forward? A little more. Okay. What, were you getting glare? Like yeah. crazy glare? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Okay, you can see that the blades are black. In our instruction sheet, I know for a fact... I, matter of fact, I'll show it to you. Why not? Why not show it to you? Because I got the page marked. <laughs> this is how you learn. This is how you learn. It's a little uh, mind-numbing, but that's all right. This is how we learn. Hello, right here. We have got the picture. Engine assembly. Bottom, bottom frame. And right there, it says propeller. Flat black with a yellow tip. Well, we all assume that that is correct, right? We all assume that that's propellers are black with yellow tips. That's what we assume. That's what the instructions tell us. But, let us put this down, because I was looking, I've done previous, I've obviously looked at pictures before this. You see, I get my little tabby here. This is what I want to show you. Let's take this tab out of here. And get right in on that top picture. And again, Dave, you tell me when there's no glare. Right now, there's no glare. No glare? You look at those props, folks. Look at those props, viewers and students. You tell me that's a black propeller. 
Ain't no even close that to being a black propeller. That is just a natural metal and it's natural metal installed on that C-47 gunship. Now, here's the deal about reference material. Let me put this down. Let, let me talk to you a little bit about reference material. Reference material is exactly that. You use it for reference. You use it for historically correct. If you do not care about building historically correct, who cares? Paint the prop purple and green with little swirly daisies on it. Who cares? But when you're building like I do for competition and, and correct, historically correct aircraft, I want to now verify that that is not a weirdo C-47 picture. It, it could be. It could be that just that one particular aircraft had a natural metal propeller. But how do we verify that this is true with military C-47s? What we do is we go to various information. And again, I have gotten the page. Where's my little tab? And what am I looking at? Where am, where am I going? Where am I going? Oh, this is what I wanted to show you. Here are black and white line drawings of different engine setups, different exhaust setups, and different propellers. So, how do we determine this? How do we know what we're going to use? Now, I gotta kinda lean over this and point to certain things for you here. This is how you use your reference. Now, it actually says pointed blade tip. That one says pointed blade tip with the small carburetor air scoop. Little tiny air scoop on that. Okay? We go down to our next picture. Again, rounded blade tip. So in other words, a paddle blade tip with a larger carburetor air scoop. Okay? Then we go down to our bottom picture. We again have the rounded paddle blade with a big, big, what does that say? That says ram, non-ram dust filter. So that is a filter that is over your carburetor air intake. We go to our kit part. Now take, get one good last shot of this one right here, Dave. Get good and close. Tell me when you're good and close. Got a glare? No, you're good. Okay. Okay, I got you. We got that. We got that. Okay, here's what we're going to do. We take that, and lo and behold, right in front of me, voila, what do we have? Does that look similar to that picture that we just looked at? Nod head, yes. Yes, it does. So these are the larger sand filter, uh, dust filter, carburetor filter. So now we know on this particular bird, we can use the paddle blade end of the prop compared to the pointed ends. Now what I'm guessing and I'm just guessing at this because I haven't checked reference material. This is more a military application because as a, I don't know if you know about props, but the wider area of the prop, the more air it grabs. That's why they put, that's why you see Corsairs with that gull wing in the Corsair. That's so they put that gull wing on so the thing could go down. They could get the landing gear up higher and they put these massive, massive propellers on them for more bite in the air. They did the same thing with the P-47s. P-47s first came out with a, with a Curtis propeller, which was very, very pointed. Then they went down to Connecticut and went to Hamilton Standard down in Connecticut, and they put these massive, massive huge blades on P-47s. The more to beat the air up, the more grab in the air. So what I'm figuring is, in a military application, you obviously want to get the full advantage of your horsepower 
compared to your blade, whereas in a civilian bird, you don't need that much pull. You just need to get there so you've got a lesser blade. Okay? So now we know which blade to use on this particular aircraft. Even though it calls it out on the instructions, that does not necessarily mean it's true. You need to go to your reference material, check your reference material, and see which one is historically correct. Again, like I say, if you don't care about historical correctness, put a seven-bladed propeller on it upside down and paint Daffy Duck on your propellers. Who cares? You're just here to enjoy this modeling experience. But if you build like myself and you build like Clambake Dave does, historically correct, because Dave is a real space guy, so Dave's got to get it correct, historically correct. I do the same thing. I check it with my reference. So, once again, we've clapped away the evil spirits. Clambake Dave and I have enjoyed coming to you. This is episode number 22. You keep on building, and we will see you again right here on Simple Diorama and Groundwork Techniques. It's actually the other way around, isn't it, Dave? Simple Groundwork and Diorama Techniques with me, your host and instructor, Bill Grigg. And along with us and all the clam bake people out there, you have a good one. Keep on modeling and try these techniques. They will work for you. Bye-bye.